Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise the Lord. This gate of the Lord, into which the righteous shall enter. I will praise thee, for thou hast heard me, and art become my salvation. Let us now in silent prayer ask for God's blessing upon our time of worship. Beloved, in the Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of Jehovah, who made heaven and earth. Grace, mercy, and peace be granted unto you from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, through the operations of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's take our Psalter in hand and sing number 163. 163. O Lord, my God, most earnestly, my heart would seek thy face within thy holy house once more to see thy glorious grace. Let's sing the three stanzas, 163.
Let us now listen with attentive minds and hearts unto the reading of God's Ten Commandments. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the waters under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Jesus gives unto us the great commandment in the New Testament when he says, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first and the great commandment And the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In response to the reading of God's law, let's sing now Psalter number 68. Number 68. Stanza 2. For thy name's sake hear thou me, for thy mercy, Lord, I wait, pardon my iniquity, for my sin is very great. Let's sing with understanding the four stanzas, Psalter number 68.
Before we pray, there are two announcements. First of all, there is an evangelism meeting scheduled for tomorrow night at 7.30 p.m. Secondly, there is an announcement in the bulletin about the report from Classes East being available on the back table, which you will not find. Uh, Lord willing, this afternoon I'll get that on the back table so that tonight you can pick up the report from Classes East if you are interested in that. Let us now bow our heads and go before our Father in prayer. O Lord our God, Thou art our covenant, faithful Father, the one who does draw us nigh unto Thee, the one whose love for us is so great that Thou didst not permit our sins to separate us from Thee, that Thou didst send Thine only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, into this world, that through His blood shed at Calvary, we might come into thy presence. Lord, how we long to be with thee, how we faint, and how weary we are as we go through this earthly pilgrimage. Thou dost send unto us trial after trial, hardship after hardship, affliction following affliction. And as we go through these many trials in life, we are reminded time and time again how weak and how frail we are. Our sinful flesh would have us think that we are strong of ourselves, that we can stand on our own might, that we are independent, that we do not need the other members of the body of Jesus Christ. But then thou dost send hardship into our life. And so quickly we are reminded once again of our inability to stand but for a moment apart from thy grace. And so we long to come into this thy house, the holy place which thou hast opened up unto us. Thou hast opened, thou hast torn apart the middle wall of partition so that we might come with boldness into this holy place. Lord, wilt thou bless us as we assemble here together as a congregation? Wilt thou strengthen that bond that we have with Jesus Christ? We thank thee for the gift of faith which thou dost give unto us, which gift is used to teach us that we have a Lord and a Savior who has died for our sins. Lord, wilt thou use the worship service this morning as a means of grace unto us. May thy word go forth and may it find ready entrance into our hearts. For many are the afflictions of the righteous. We pray, Lord, for those who are going through difficult, trying times. Wilt thou be with the elderly members of this congregation? Uphold them all the days of their life. May they continue to see and to know that thou art a good God who never abandons his own. Wilt thou be, Lord, with those who are sick, those who suffered injury, those who are recovering from illness, from surgery. Lord, wilt thou be unto us the balm of Gilead. Thou art the great physician. Restore quickly to health and strength according to thy good pleasure. Wilt thou bless the marriages of this congregation. May our homes be a place where there is Christian love, shown one to another. May our homes and marriages be happy. May we be blessed 
with the Spirit of Jesus Christ. Wilt thou teach us as husbands how to love even as Jesus Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. We confess that we as husbands fall so far short of that mark which thou hast set for us. We are by nature very inconsiderate of the needs of others. We as husbands are by nature self-centered, more interested in our own care and growth than we are about encouraging and upbuilding our spouses and our children. Lord, wilt thou continue to be gracious unto those of us who are wives. Thou hast called us as wives to submit and to show reverence unto our husbands, even as the church is called to submit and to show reverence unto Jesus Christ, who is her head. We confess as wives that to submit goes against our nature, that our natural inclination is to be rebellious, to be stubborn, to show and to assert our independence of our husband. Lord, wilt thou be gracious unto us as wives that we might learn day by day to submit and respect the ones who are our heads over us. Bless our children. We thank thee that they could have a good beginning to the school year, receiving the instruction prepared for them in our covenant Christian school. But thou work, Lord, in our children, yea, even our young children, the infants of this congregation, that they might have faith. That as they grow up and as they are taught about Jesus Christ and about the wonderful works which he has performed for them, may our children come more and more to know thee, to love thee, and to follow thee all the days of their lives. Lord, may thy word dwell in us richly in this Sabbath day. Give unto us an extra measure of thy Holy Spirit that we might understand the truths of thy word and that thy word might be a light and a lamp upon our pathway. May we treasure thy word, loving it more than what we love, silver and gold, riches, power, or even physical health and strength. But as we go through the difficult times of life, may thy word speak to us. May we view thy word not simply as an old old document written by mere men thousands of years ago, but may we view thy word as the living and the powerful word, the word which speaks to our present needs, a word, a word which convicts us of our sins, of our shortcomings of obedience to thy holy commandment a word which, by the power of thy Spirit, leads us to be ashamed of those sins and to cry out unto thee, our Lord and our Savior, for the remission of our sins. And then may thy word come to us and may thy word be a source of comfort unto us as we hear in thy word that if we confess our sins, that then thou art faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And then may thy word be unto us a guide, teaching us the way in which we are to go, leading us on that straight and narrow pathway which leads unto life everlasting. We read in thy word of the glories 
of the heavenly kingdom which thou hast prepared for us, a mansion which thou dost give unto us as our inheritance, a mansion which we have not built, a mansion which we do not deserve, and yet a mansion which thou dost give unto us in thy saving love for us, thy children. Lord, how we long for the day in which we'll be brought into the glories of heaven, the day in which we'll behold Jesus Christ, our Savior, face to face, the day in which there will be no more sickness and no more sorrow, the day in which there will be no more tears which are wiped away from our eyes, but a day in which we will enjoy everlasting blessedness, for happy is that people whose God is the Lord. While we wait the day in which thou dost take us to be with thee, give unto us faithfulness. Lord, teach us to number our days and to apply our hearts unto wisdom's ways. May pride never reign in our hearts, and free of great sin we will be. Forgive the sins which we have committed in the early hours of this day. Give unto us a good hour of worship together. May we worship thee in spirit and in truth. Bless those who desired to be with us this morning, but who could not gather with us. Give unto them a Sabbath day's blessing as well. Give no peace to those who willfully have kept themselves from this thy house. Return them unto the flock. Lord, may the words of our mouths the meditations of our hearts be acceptable unto Thee, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Receive this prayer for Jesus' sake. Amen. Two collections this morning. The first is for the General Fund and the second is for the Benevolent Fund.
Let's sing now Psalm number 141. 141. Based on Psalm 51, where the psalmist David makes confession of sin. Let's sing from the heart the four stanzas, Psalm number 141. Let us start in God's Word this morning to Luke chapter 3. Luke 3. We will read this morning the first 22 verses, 1 through 22 of Luke chapter 3. Now in the fifteenth year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate being governor of Judea, and Herod being tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip tetrarch of Iturea, and of the region of Trachonitis, 
and Lysanias, the tetrarch of Abilene, Annas and Caiaphas being the high priests, the word of God came unto John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he came into all the country about Jordan, preaching the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. As it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways shall be made smooth. And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Then said he to the multitude that came forth to be baptized of him, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come, bring forth therefore fruits worthy of repentance, and begin not to say within yourselves, We have Abraham to our father, for I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham. And now also the axe is laid unto the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, which bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. And the people asked him, saying, What shall we do then? He answereth and saith unto them, He that hath two coats, let him impart to him that hath none. And he that hath meat, let him do likewise. Then came also publicans to be baptized, and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And he said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages." And as the people were in expectation, and all men mused in their hearts of John, whether he were the Christ or not, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire, whose fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly purge his floor, and will gather the wheat into his garner, but the chaff he will burn with fire unquenchable. And many other things in his exhortation preached he unto the people. But Herod the Tetrarch, being reproved by him for Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, and for all the evils which Herod had done, added yet this above all, that he shut up John in prison. Now when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also, being baptized and praying, the heaven was opened. And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee, I am well pleased. Thus far we read God's holy and inerrant word. May God add his blessing unto the reading of the Holy Scriptures. It's on the basis of Luke 3 and many other passages in Scripture that we find the instruction of the Heidelberg Catechism, Lord's Day 26. Lord's Day 26, how art thou admonished and assured by holy baptism that the one sacrifice of Christ upon the cross is of real advantage to thee? Thus, that Christ appointed this external washing with water, adding thereto this promise, that I am as certainly washed by his blood and spirit from the pollution of my soul, that is, from all my sins, as I am washed externally with water 
by which the filthiness of the body is commonly washed away. What is it to be washed with the blood and spirit of Christ? It is to receive of God the remission of sins freely for the sake of Christ's blood, which he shed for us by his sacrifice upon the cross, and also to be renewed by the Holy Ghost and sanctified to be members of Christ, that so we may more and more die unto sin and lead holy and unblameable lives. Where has Christ promised us that he will as certainly wash us by his blood and spirit as we are washed with the water of baptism. In the institution of baptism, which is thus expressed, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. This promise is also repeated where the scripture calls baptism the washing of regeneration and the washing away of sins. Beloved congregation in the Lord Jesus Christ, John the Baptist was led by the Holy Spirit out into the wilderness by the Jordan River. And out there in the wilderness, the Spirit of God gave unto John the Baptist a message that was to be delivered unto the Old Testament Israelites. And the message that was to go unto the Israelites at the very end of the Old Testament, right before pouring out of the Spirit, which would start the New Testament, the message that John the Baptist was to give unto the Israelites was a call to repentance. Luke 3, verse 3, he preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. The reason that John the Baptist called the Old Testament Israelites unto repentance was the Israelites were guilty of backsliding. They had fallen away from the holy path to which the Lord had called them, and they had walked instead in ways of wickedness. Time after time throughout Old Testament history, God had sent the prophets unto Old Testament Israel, calling the Israelites unto repentance. Time after time, God had shown mercy unto the Israelites as the Israelites repented of their sins and God forgave them, anticipating the cross of Jesus Christ. And now God sends one last prophet before Jesus Christ. He preached the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. God's message to his church in the New Testament some 2,000 years later has not changed. God's message to you and to me this morning is a call to repentance. It is a call to turn from backsliding. The church, apart from the grace of God, continually falls back into the same sin. And we who are the individual members of the church, apart from the grace of God, continually fall into the same sins. And so God gives 
unto us then as the members of his church to call him to repent, to be baptized, to believe in Jesus Christ. Let's look then this morning at the meaning of being baptized by Christ's blood and spirit. Baptized by Christ's blood and spirit. First, we'll look at the meaning of the phrase that we are baptized by Christ's blood. Second, baptized by his spirit. And then third, we'll see what advantage this is for us. The Catechism speaks of being baptized by the blood of Christ. Question 70, what is it to be washed with the blood and the spirit of Christ? To be baptized with the blood of Christ is to receive the remission of our sins in Jesus Christ. It is to be justified in the sight of God. It is for God to cover our iniquities with the precious blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. But if we are to be impressed with the wonder that happens when when God covers our sins, then we must first of all be informed, and sorry for our sins. If the starting point is not a consciousness of the sins that I have committed against the holiness of God, then to hear about sins being covered with the blood of Jesus Christ will not impact me in any meaningful way. It will simply be a lecture about what God does for other people. But if the truth of us, of we God's people, being baptized with the blood of Jesus Christ is going to have a deep and meaningful impact on our lives, if it is going to be a truth that lives in our hearts throughout the course of this coming week, then we must first understand what is it that we are being cleansed from. If the clothing is fresh and clean, there is no need for the washing machine. If the marker board is already white, there is no need for the eraser. If you are spotless, then there is no need for baptism. What are our sins? The Catechism describes our sins as the pollution of our soul. That's what our sins are. They are the pollution of our souls. Our sins pollute us. They make us filthy. Filthy in the sight of the Almighty God who is holy and perfect and has no wickedness within Him. But further, our sins make us filthy to the other members of the church of Jesus Christ. When the husband sins against the wife, then that sin makes him filthy. And the same for the wife to the husband. And so we lament then the sins which we have committed against the holy God. We lament that there are words that come off of our lips, which words are not intended to encourage, edify, build up as other members of the church, but which words are intended to cut, to destroy, and to harm. We lament the fact that so much of our life we go through thinking about our own wants and our own desires, forgetting about the fact that the reason that God has created us is so that we can glorify the almighty name of Jehovah God. We lament the fact 
that so frequently our minds turn from God. That's what repentance means. John preached the baptism of repentance. But the fact that we need to repent, that is, turn back to God, means by nature our minds are turned away from God. And so we lament the fact that instead of caring about the things of God's heavenly kingdom, instead of seeking first Jesus Christ and His righteousness, so often our minds are turned away from God. We lament the fact that the trials of this life through which God is pleased to send us oftentimes reveal the pollution of our souls. Instead of responding to these trials with bended knee, instead of responding to these trials by turning to the Word of the Lord, and finding grace and strength in His Word, how often do we not respond to the trials of this earth by becoming bitter, angry, criticizing even God's plan for us? We who are creatures of the dust and who are returned to the dust, have the audacity to complain about God's ways for us. The pollution of our souls makes us filthy, makes us dirty. We are an undesirable people by nature. And as we speak here about the sins which are committed, our thoughts do not go and must not go to the neighbor. We must not think, well, I hope that this neighbor is listening to this sermon. I hope that the person sitting next to me, in front of me, or behind me in the pews hears this sermon about the pollution of the soul. They really need to hear about how sinful they are are, they need to hear about how their offenses have hurt me. No. This is not about what the neighbor has done to God. If our primary concern is about the pollution of the neighbor, then we are mere bystanders as we watch the neighbor be cleansed with the blood of Jesus Christ. We're just an observer. This is about my sin, your sins, as individual members of the church of Jesus Christ. I am by nature polluted with sin. I deserve to be cast far, far away from God, never to taste and to see that God is good. The spiritual power of baptism is this, that God in His grace forgives me my sins. We are cleansed with the blood of Jesus Christ. John preached in Luke 3, verse 3, the baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Remission means to let go. God does not cling tightly to the sins which we have committed against Him. God does not contemplate those sins and think of how filthy or how worthless we are by nature, but God lets those sins go. He covers them with the blood of His Son, Jesus Christ. The catechism calls attention to the fact that God does this freely. Question 70, what is it to be washed with the blood and spirit of Christ? It is to receive of God 
the remission of sins freely for the sake of Christ's blood. That word freely is a small word, but it is an important word. It is a word that can be difficult for us to understand because we are taught that there is nothing free on this earth. If you want something, then you better work for it. You better strive for it. You better put your effort, put forth great effort for it. And then as a result of you putting forth great effort for something, then you can receive something. Even children understand the basic of economics. That if children receive a gift from mother and father, perhaps, although that gift is free to the child, the young children understand this cost mom and dad something free to me, but it costs mom and dad something to give me this gift. Well, so it is, beloved, for us in our salvation. From our perspective, the gift of the washing away of the pollution of our souls is free. It is not something that you strive for and that you earn as a result of your striving. It is not something that you get because you have performed some task, but it is something that God gives unto you from your perspective freely. But from God's perspective, it was expensive. It cost Him the life of His own Son, Jesus Christ. His blood shed to cover the pollution of your souls. How great, then, is the one who gives unto us the remission of our sins. He must be great. He must be different than us by nature because we by nature would never give up our lives for the sake of an unworthy individual. How great is our God. John the Baptist calls attention to the greatness of our mediator. He does so in Luke 3, verse 16, where he draws a contrast between himself and Jesus Christ. Luke 3, 16, John answered, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose, he shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. John draws here a number of, of contrasts. He draws these contrasts because there was a crowd of people that was, had followed him out into the wilderness, and this crowd of people had become enamored with John the Baptist. There was something distinct about John, something that set him apart from the scribes and the Pharisees. He was one who preached unto the people with authority. He was an interesting fellow. He wore a coat of camel's skin. He ate locusts and honey for his food. And yet, he, did, he was not wearied as a result of his diet, but he went forth with strength and with courage, calling the people unto repentance and baptism. And so the crowds of people then coming out to the wilderness with John the Baptist started to muse within themselves, wonder within themselves, is this the promised Messiah? Is this the long-awaited one that for thousands of Old Testament years we have been praying for His coming? Now put yourselves momentarily in the shoes of John the Baptist. What a temptation that would have been for John the Baptist to live for just a moment in the glory and the fame that he has receiving. What a temptation it would be to gloat in the fact that 
All of these people have left behind the comforts of their homes and have come out into the wilderness with me, and they are so impressed with my abilities and my preaching that they wonder if I am the Messiah. And so John could have, from a human perspective, played along just a little bit with the crowds and said, well, I'm not the Messiah, but I'm the next best thing to the Messiah. John could have exalted himself up as the deliverer of the Old Testament Israelites, but he didn't. He drew a significant contrast between himself and Jesus Christ. John said, I baptize with water, but one mightier than I cometh the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. One mightier than I cometh. The word mighty means greater, more powerful. You think that I am powerful? You think that I have the ability to convince and exhort and prick you? Well, there's one infinitely mightier than I, infinitely more powerful than I who is coming. And not only is this coming individual more powerful than I, but in addition, he is transcendent. He is more majestic than I am. For I am not worthy to unloose the latchet of his shoes. Normally the task of removing the shoes of a guest in a home was the task that was reserved for the lowliest slave, the lowliest servant in the house. The lowliest servant would do the work of taking off, removing, and then washing the feet of the guest who had come into the house. John testified of his relationship to Jesus Christ that this man is so great that I am not even worthy to be the lowliest servant, the lowliest slave in his kingdom. I do not deserve to take off his shoes. Why did John draw these contrasts between himself and the Messiah? John did so not because he himself was particularly evil in comparison to the rest of the people who surrounded him. It's not as if the rest of the crowds of the Jews who thronged about him were holy enough, good enough to remove the shoes of Jesus Christ, whereas John the Baptist in distinction was worse than them. That's not it. Nor was it the case that John here was simply putting on a show of piety, a pretense of humility. Uh, I'm so humble that I, I don't even dare to go into the presence of this great individual. No, that's not what John was doing here. As John the Baptist said these words before the crowds of people, John did so under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit led him to say these words. The Spirit recorded these words in the pages of Scripture. And the Spirit leads us to see that John said these words in order to call attention to the divinity of the Messiah. That's why John the Baptist said that there is one coming who is mightier than I, that is one who is more powerful than I am powerful. You think I am powerful, my power is nothing in comparison to the divine power of the one who will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. 
all I can do as I baptize you is sprinkle water on your head or immerse you under the waters of the Jordan River. But there is one coming who will baptize you, not just on the outside, but He baptizes you on the inside. He baptizes you with His blood, which covers your sins. How great is this one? He is the transcendent God, the everlasting Word, who came down into this world in human flesh, so that that same flesh might be broken at Golgotha. How great is this one, the latchet of whose shoes I am not worthy to unloose? He is the Lord of grace. The one who extends favor to you, though you do not deserve it. This is the identity of the one who baptizes with his blood, covering every single sin which we have committed. He baptizes not only with His blood, but also by His Spirit. The Hedeberg Catechism speaks of the baptism with the Spirit. Question 70. What is it to be washed with the blood and Spirit of Christ? And then John the Baptist as well in Luke 3 verse 16 the second half of that verse, He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. For us to understand what it means that we are baptized with the Holy Ghost, let's begin by seeking to understand what it means that we are baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Fire. It's not something that we typically think of when we think of baptism. We think of cleansing, we think of water, but generally we don't think of fire when we think of the baptism font. If anything, water is used to put out fires, and so it seems almost contradictory to speak of being baptized on the one hand with water, but on the other hand being baptized by or with fire. What we must understand is that this word fire recorded in Luke 3, verse 16, explains what it means to be baptized with the Holy Ghost. These two phrases belong together. To be baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire, the baptism by fire explains our baptism by or with the Holy Ghost. It's not as if there are two separate baptisms, that one is baptized on the one hand with the Holy Ghost and on the other hand with fire. It is not as if these are applied to separate different individuals, that those who are elect are baptized with the Holy Ghost and those who are reprobate are baptized with fire. That's not the meaning here when John says, speaks of being baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire. But instead, John is employing a literary device here where the second word explains the former word. The fire, being baptized with the fire, explains our baptism by the Holy Ghost. We understand that throughout Scripture, fire does indeed picture the Holy Ghost. One only has to think of Pentecost, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, where there were the cloven tongues as of fire that descended upon the heads of the saints in the room. In the original, in Luke 3, verse 16, it is emphasized that these two words explain each other, that fire explains Holy Ghost by the fact that there is only one preposition with in the original Greek 
In the King James translation, they insert an extra word with in there. And it's just, it reads, I will baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. That second with really should be omitted. In the original, it's you are baptized with Holy Ghost and fire. These two are one. The fire explains the power and the operation of the Holy Ghost as the Holy Ghost enters into us. So for us to understand then what it means to be baptized by the Holy Ghost, let's begin by looking at fire. What does fire do? A couple of truths, simple truths with regard to fire. First of all, fire, as fire comes into contact with man, hurts. To be burned with fire stings, and if one is exposed to too much fire, it will take one's life away. The sting of smoke, as smoke comes into one's eyes, that, that hurts, that stings the individual. So that in the first place, fire is painful. The second simple and basic truth with regard to fire is fire has the power of transformation. When the fire sweeps through the forests, as fires do at this time of the year, as the fires go through the forest, the fires change the appearance of that forest. Old, large trees are burned down and then room is made for new growth to come up in that forest. Many times, oftentimes our view of fires is a negative view. Children can be afraid of fires. We don't like the smoke that comes from fires. But oftentimes in creation, fires are a good thing. They are necessary in order to maintain the balance of the ecosystem in creation. In the Midwest, for example, before the land became farmland planted with corn and soybeans, it used to be all prairies where the buffalo would roam. But those prairies needed to be maintained by fires. Fires would come through and burn out the old growth in order that new prairie grass could grow. The same is true in other places of creation. That fire has the power of transforming. What does it mean then to be baptized by the Holy Spirit? Ghost. To be baptized by the Holy Ghost means, beloved, the Holy Ghost changes us. Just as fire goes forth through creation, and fire has that power of transforming the, that part of creation, so it is that the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Ghost enters into our hearts, He transforms us. The Holy Ghost transforms not just a part of us, but the Holy Ghost is pleased to work in us so that He transforms the whole of the person. We mustn't view regeneration by the Holy Spirit as simply being the Holy Spirit planting a new life within an individual and then the Holy Spirit not doing anything else besides. It's not as if our body, our physical body, is simply the shell or the box in which the new man of Jesus Christ lives. And that then because our body is simply the shell or the box in which the Holy Spirit dwells, that then it's indifferent what we do with our bodies. We mustn't view our bodies that way. But instead, the Scriptures speak of our bodies as being the temple of the living God. And so the Holy Spirit, as the Holy Spirit enters into our hearts, the Spirit is not content simply to plant that new seed of life within us and then leave that new life within us. But the Spirit works in our hearts so that that new man grows and grows so that more and more than we are transformed into the image of God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Romans 12, verse 1. The Christian is called to present his bodies unto God as a living sacrifice, 
holy and acceptable unto God. To be baptized by the Holy Ghost is to have the Holy Ghost work in us the willing and the doing of God's good pleasure. He changes us, but oftentimes this change hurts. It's painful. Remember what we said about fire? When fire comes into contact with man, it hurts. So the Holy Ghost, as the Holy Ghost works in us to will and to do of God's good pleasure and to resist things of the world, it hurts. It's painful. Pain is generally generally viewed in our society as a bad thing, an evil thing. Man does everything in his power to remove, avoid, or alleviate pain. Pain is not enjoyable, Pain is, therefore, something that the world portrays as being evil. But God's Word does not teach that pain in and of itself is evil. Pain is the result of evil. It is because we fell into sin in the garden that now we endure Pain, but pain of itself is not always evil. In fact, pain oftentimes can be a good thing. A person who is struggling with cancer goes through the pain of chemotherapy treatments in order to try and eradicate cancer from the body. The athlete goes through the pain of self-discipline in order that that athlete's body might be strengthened so that he can compete. Pain in and of itself is not always an evil thing. As the Spirit works in us, renewing us into the image of God's own Son, oftentimes That work of the Holy Spirit is painful. How we cling by nature to the pollution of our souls. How we delight by nature in the wickedness and the evil entertainment that this world has to offer unto us how we cling to those sins and how we loathe the thought of letting go of them. And then we deceive ourselves into thinking that our life will be a happier, more satisfied life if we cling to this wickedness. And so we hold on to it with our fists tightly clenched onto that wickedness, convinced that our life will be a better life if we have this sin in our life. And then the Spirit comes and He powerfully bends our will. And at times that bending of our will hurts. It's painful as that old man is put to death. God uses Baptism, to encourage us then. Encourage us as we fight against our sins. This was true for the Israelites, the Jews who came to John the Baptist in the wilderness. Luke 3, verse 12. Then came also publicans to be baptized and said unto him, Master, what shall we do? And John the Baptist said unto them, Exact no more than that which is appointed you. 
And the soldiers likewise demanded of him, saying, And what shall we do? And he said unto them, Do violence to no man, neither accuse any falsely, and be content with your wages. They came, they were baptized, and they received the word to be holy. And so we do well then as God's people to think back upon our baptism. Our baptism is for our advantage. It was for the advantage of Jesus Christ. Jesus was brought by John the Baptist, led down to the Jordan River, and there baptized. And there Jesus received the words of His Father in heaven, This is My beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. What an encouragement unto Jesus Christ as Jesus then began the work of His earthly ministry. As He was then led of the wilder, of the, into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Jesus could reflect back on His baptism and on the words that the Father had spoken unto Him that He was the beloved Son of the Father in whom the Father was well pleased. The baptism of Jesus Christ gave no small measure of strength and encouragement to Jesus as Jesus went about the work that the Father had called Him unto. Beloved, if it was true of Jesus Christ that His baptism was for His advantage, then how much more so is it not the case that our baptism is for our advantage? Jesus Christ Himself was sinless, and yet the baptism was for His advantage. And we, in distinction from Him, are corrupt and defiled with sin. And so the baptism that God gives unto us then is for our spiritual advantage. The advantage is this, beloved, it pictures for us the cleansing of our sins. John said in Luke 3, verse 6, And all flesh shall see the salvation of God. For the saints who lived on the earth at the time of Jesus Christ, they could see with their physical eyes the salvation of God. They could see Jesus Christ walking on this earth, ministering to them. They could see Jesus Christ hanged on Calvary, His body broken for their sins. We cannot see with our physical eyes, Jesus Christ. And yet God is pleased to give unto us a picture of our salvation. So that this verse is true for us as well, that all flesh shall see the salvation of God. God gives unto us the sacrament of holy baptism as a visible sign and seal by which we see the salvation of God. And so then, beloved, behold by faith your baptism in Jesus Christ. Certainly it is true that for those who were baptized as an infant, that you have no recollection of your baptism. For those advanced in years, it happened long, a long, long time ago. We cannot remember the physical event of our baptism, but our parents have told us about that event of our baptism. And God gives unto us reminders of our baptism every time that another child is brought to the baptism font. And so as we observe then with our physical eyes the sacrament of holy baptism, may we contemplate the advantage of baptism 
for us that God has freely given unto me the remission of my sins and that God by the Holy Spirit renews me so that I do His good pleasure. Thanks be to God for the gift of holy baptism. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father which art in heaven, we thank Thee for the promise of Jesus Christ, that just as we are externally washed with water, so internally we are washed from the pollution and filth of our sins. Give us to see, Lord, the wonder of this truth for us personally. Strengthen and confirm our faith by the means of the sacraments. For Jesus' sake, amen. Let's sing now, Psalm number 15. Number 15. Entitled, God's Glory in His Works. Let's sing the three stanzas, Psalm number 15.
May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you all. Amen.